Hey all here OS Reviews, over the past few months we've done revisited reviews on a couple of foldable phones including the 2019 Moto Razr as well as the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip series which are now both considered as budget foldables that sell for around $200 on the used market. A pretty sharp reduction compared to the one grand and higher that these foldable devices commanded just a few years back. However, we have yet to cover a larger screen foldable device on our channel, and so today we are taking a revisited look back at the original first generation Royale FlexPie. Although mostly forgotten about and definitely not as big of a name as compared to Motorola and Samsung, believe it or not, the FlexPie was actually the first foldable smartphone back in late 2018, over five years ago. So yes, this actually beat the first generation Samsung Galaxy Z Fold to hit the market by a couple of months. That being said, it wasn't the most polished experience, especially as a smartphone, primarily because this company, Royale, is more about making displays. They have also come out with a couple of head-mounted displays in the past, including the Royale Moon. It's an alternative to some of the AR glasses that we've been seeing recently from companies like Xreal or Nreal. So they specialize in making these curved OLED panels, and one way to showcase that tech was in the form of a smartphone. Although they've largely pivoted to the commercial space, making larger billboard displays that wraps around buildings and other flexible panels for those applications. So it's been a while since we've seen a consumer-oriented device from this company. They did try to come out with a second generation FlexPi 2, a slightly newer processor and a more improved hinge mechanism, but even that was a couple of years back. Of course, a foldable like this is still quite novel from a design perspective. When fully expanded, it has a 7.8 inch OLED display at Full HD 1080p resolution, very similar in fact to something like an iPad mini when it comes to the overall form factor. And of course, when you fold it shut, it becomes more of a conventional smartphone in terms of size. Namely, it has an 18 by nine aspect ratio or two by one, very tall display, similar to on modern day smartphones. And then on the other side, interestingly enough, it retains a more more boxy 16 by 9 aspect ratio versus 4 by 3 aspect ratio in the tablet mode. That said, aside from the Huawei Mate X series, which also shares a similar exterior folding screen design, we haven't really seen too many other foldables like this. Most of them have opted for the screen actually folding internally that protects the screen a little bit better as you're traveling, since the soft folding screen is not gonna be revealed as you're putting it into your pocket, for example, even though it looks really cool from a design perspective, and there's a little bit less redundancy since it just does everything with one panel instead. But again, it is fully revealed. Now, one reason why we are revisiting this device, aside from it being the first ever available folding phone, is because if you're in certain markets, including Asia, this has now become one of the cheapest foldables that you can pick up on the used slash third-party marketplace. Oftentimes, the street price is as low as $100. This unit in particular has some cosmetic blemishes, but as a result, it was even cheaper at around only $50, which puts it squarely into the budget territory as far as a large screen foldable device is concerned. That being said, availability is often obviously going to depend on locale and market that you're in. Since it was mostly released in those regions and have since been discontinued, it's why we see such a huge price reduction in. But therefore, it becomes kind of a fun way to play around with a large screen foldable at a fraction of the cost without really spending an arm or a leg. Royale claims that the display is sturdy enough to withstand over 200,000 folds, and it's powered by the Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 processor, this octa-core chip, as we've seen in prior videos, including phones like the LG G8X, and the Samsung Galaxy S10 series is a flagship processor of yesteryear that has surprisingly held up quite well, so general performance when it comes to navigation and casual phone usage still really isn't a problem on this chip. In fact, it still is quite speedy. That being said, it does not have a high refresh rate screen, and also it's not a 5G enabled chip, so data is restricted to 4G LTE, although you do have dual band Wi-Fi, NFC, GPS, and Bluetooth. Another interesting design trait of a screen that folds outwards is having only one camera system comprising of a 20 megapixel primary and a 16 megapixel ultra wide angle lens to do all the work. That is, you can either take selfies with it or if you're folding it into the phone form factor, of course it will point onto the other side. As a result, the screen itself is uninterrupted. It doesn't have any cutouts, any teardrops or notches of any kind, relying on just that one sensor to take higher quality selfies as well as for regular shots pointing away from you. The software experience is what 
Royale calls WaterOS. It is a custom UI on top of Android 9 originally with some gesture as well as accidental touch protection modes that we'll also see later on in a moment. And otherwise they claim this is going to be a better experience again for things like multitasking. That's kind of the whole point of having a foldable large screen phone. You can use it like a mini tablet and be able to also consume media more easily as well. Put it onto a kickstand and have something like a little mouse or keyboard for doing a bit of work when on the go. And of course then fold it into a phone size device when you're actually traveling. It does have stereo speakers, although it does not have Qi wireless charging on this model, and it's powered by a 4,000 mAh capacity battery, which is okay. However, it is a little bit on the small side, considering that you are technically looking at a nearly 8-inch device but still mostly lasts through a day's use. Otherwise, there is up to 8 gigabytes of RAM inside and comes configured up to 512 gigabytes of built-in storage, further expandable via a micro SD card slot. A closer look at design, the build quality of the FlexBuy is kind of controversial because the build of materials on the most part is glass and aluminum like on other premium smartphones. That being said, the hinge mechanism bizarrely uses this elastic band type material that in retrospect was not a very good decision. In fact, Marquez from MKBHD actually called this when first reviewing this in 2018 and predicted it would not last for a long time because unfortunately rubber has a tendency to lose its elasticity over time, and that is exactly what has happened to most of the used units, which is why on this model you can actually peel off this rubber band altogether, which is practically just glued into place, revealing the hinge mechanism on the inside and having a higher chance for dust particles to get collected in there as well, although this first generation foldable did not have any IP rating of any kind to begin with. But still, this was kind of a, again, poor, I guess, hardware decision from a hinge perspective. Thankfully, we have yet to see another hinge design like this going forward. All other companies have since opted for actual metal in the folding mechanisms, which can withstand more wear and tear and have held up significantly better uh, when looking back. But just an interesting quirk on this OG model to be aware of. That being said, of course, the phone is still functional, even without rubber flap covering it up. However, it just looks a little bit unsightly. The back material, though, is constructed out of glass and for the most part does feel decent as you're holding it and has kind of a reflective shimmer to it although it is a little bit of a fingerprint magnet. As far as IO is concerned on the very bottom here is so we have the type C port, some of the embedded antenna lines onto the aluminum rails. On the very top here we also have stereo loudspeakers offering a pretty decent multimedia experience. And then located on the right-hand spine was access to a volume rocker, which was sandwiched by an optical fingerprint reader, also worked decently and another physical power on and off key. That being said, unfortunately missing on the Royale FlexPi would be any 3.5mm headphone jack, though I guess for flagship phones in this day and age we have mostly come to expect that. This model again has sustained a bit of cosmetic blemishes, including some leakage on the display that was likely due to too much pressure being applied on the screen, perhaps it was dropped by a previous user. Uh, that being said, of course, you can also find a like new condition model since Royale was never too successful when these things came out for, again, around 100 bucks street price. But regardless, I can still tell that the screen quality seems to be pretty decent, which isn't too surprising considering this is mostly a display company. They have pretty good viewing angles due to the OLED nature. Contrast and vibrancy both seem to be quite good, and overall it's an enjoyable enough experience as far as entertainment and just navigating around the UI here is concerned. Unfortunately though, WaterOS being more of a skin that was released again in Asia as well as in the China market does not come with the Google Play services. Royale probably just didn't pay the licensing fees to Google for using these services because they were trying to cut on costs. So unfortunately, if you're trying to install, again, third-party apps, you would have to sideload them using APKs that you drag over or download from the browser. And a little bit of a shame there. That being said, the software still gives you kind of interesting peek at custom utility tools designed by Royale from the ground up, including their own clock app, as you can tell here. A lot of these icons as well as animations do look quite different. There's also a memo pad that Royale created where you can more quickly annotate as well as highlight different notes and PDFs. That being said, this does not support any active stylus pen like a Wacom digitizer, so as a result there isn't really pressure sensitivity. 
unlike say on later generation Galaxy Z Fold devices with the S Pen support, which was a little bit of a missed opportunity. Uh, that being said, again, other applications including the menu here for advanced settings also splits it into two columns and takes advantage of the slightly larger display that we have here. At the very least, there's not too much bloatware going on aside from the standard utility tools including the browser and file manager. So if you're looking at the 128 gigabyte model, you still have over 100 gigabytes of space to install additional content including media files that you desire. Now, you will find some additional optimization tricks from Royale, including what they call edge touch shortcuts. The middle section of the screen within the curve section at least will actually become a kind of third panel, so to speak, with some of those shortcut widgets being visible, as you can tell here, located on the edge. So it behaves quite similar to a sidebar that we see on, for example, Samsung devices, but on this particular device, it just occupies a little bit of the curved aspect of the screen as you're holding it. Now, by the way, when the phone is actually folded in half, the orientation is interestingly not completely locked. So you can still use it like a mini tablet if you're holding it in this horizontal orientation or of course in the portrait mode. And the back of the phone is actually disabled until you turn it over. So there are some parallels with curved screen phones, including devices like older generation Galaxy S8s, S9s, as well as on something like the first generation Motorola Edge. It really relies on having software optimization to disable certain parts of the screen and only register touch on the part that is being activated. It's even more so on this phone since the entire screen is technically being held in your hand under this mode. But surprisingly, the software here at the very least seems to be doing an okay job, at least a little bit better than I was expecting, considering how dramatic this curvature is and the fact that you're literally holding onto the screen on the back here. But for the most part, I didn't encounter too many ghost or accidental touches uh, when using it as a conventional smartphone mode. That being said, when folded in half, this is definitely quite a chunky device, and there is a bit of an unsightly gap there in the middle, similar to, again, on some of those first-generation Samsung devices where additional lint and dust can kind of pass through as compared to it being completely flat. So some of those edge gestures on the side here allow you to trigger functions including a quick voice recorder mode, as well as taking an image very quickly by jumping into the camera jumping into the memo pad, and also into a quick payment service option. So this is a sidebar that you can bring in and out depending on how you're using the phone. Having such a dramatic curvature onto the edge of the phone definitely looks cool when you're just staring at it from afar. This profile view is actually kind of ridiculous in terms of how far back it goes because, again, the screen is literally being folded in half. In this position, you can also have a little bit of a side bezel there on the edge to hold onto the device if you're using it for reading, for example. Now, I think this is also a good opportunity to take a quick look at the camera here on the very top, which at the very least does support HDR, and you are able to very quickly kind of pinch in and out for some digital zoom, as well as navigate with some pre-built-in filters that you can apply onto your shots. Of course, it's not gonna be anything extremely sophisticated, which is kind of expected, again, from a smaller company that's more about hardware rather than software optimization. You can't expect this to really rival a Pixel or even a Galaxy phone from its same generation, but at least for just simple snaps, it seems to do an all right job. Because of the Snapdragon 855 chip, you can record video up to 4K 30 FPS as well without too many problems. So there's also a portrait mode that you can also apply kind of an artificial bokeh effect onto your shots. Although interestingly, on the 16 by 9 aspect ratio side, since there's a little bit more room, you have a few additional settings that were not available on the other side. For example, there is a baby mode, which interestingly enough, when you're capturing an image, it will use the rear display to also show kind of a fun animation to try and get the baby to smile or laugh. There's also the presence of a dedicated night mode on this side as well that will increase the exposure time to let in more light. And as far as the results are concerned, again, it is surprisingly all right as just a casual camera phone. Of course, you can't expect really miracles here, but 20 megapixels can still get sufficient detail as you're zooming on in. Again, it's not gonna really beat a pixel or anything crazy like that, but with HDR support, you can still get some decent enough looking results as long as you're a little bit more patient with it and you don't shake too much because these don't have any optical image stabilization, so it all relies on EIS and software for sharpening. And now moving into a video and also a demo of the speakers sound like next.
takeaway being that it actually has some decent stereo separation, although bass is a little bit lacking and can distort and sound a little bit thin on the higher volume levels, but still is good enough for a smartphone speaker, especially as a stereo pair. More impressively though, is definitely the immersiveness of this display, just because you get such a larger panel as compared to what you'll find on a conventional smartphone when it comes to consuming media in this tablet mode, that is. Again, it is like having just a iPad mini with you that you can fit in your pocket. It certainly does look quite good on this, again, full HD resolution display, which also has, again, very vivid colors overall. Reception quality also doesn't seem to be too problematic for the most part making it a pretty comfortable experience, again, for web browsing and for reading back content in general. In similar fashion, you can also use the multitasking here a lot more effectively with two panels split side by side. For example, you can definitely be watching back a video or browsing the web at the same time or taking notes on the other side. And ultimately, those are the strengths of a large screen foldable, again, like this, whether it comes to consuming media, as well as, again, browsing the web, doing a bit of multitasking, which is why I think this particular form factor still has a lot of potential, even if this first generation model, of course, has a lot of shortcomings, or if you're just curious about this form factor in general before you invest more in a newer and more expensive foldable phone, devices like the OnePlus Open, for example, Samsung Galaxy Z Folds, which can still retail north of $1,000 to $2,000, this might still be kind of a fun DIY type project, or at least a way for you to dip your toes into what this type of technology, the hardware at least, is capable of doing, even if the software is really far from perfect. Still kind of an interesting device looking back and has its position in mobile history. To some extent, innovation as well as competition in the smartphone space is always welcome, and we can certainly hope that in the future, perhaps Royale will come out with more interesting devices to come, even if this particular unit wasn't super commercially successful. And fundamentally, it's still a pretty cool device, even all these years later. So you can check out more details if interested and learn more about Royale in the links down below, as well as new foldables. But for now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been a revisited look back at the first generation ever foldable smartphone, the Royale FlexPi.